A Zelda game without bosses is like a bowl of ramen with only oh. noodles. It's like, wait, what? You've heard this intro before? Oh, I see. I used it in the last video. Okay, l let me do something new. <clears throat> a Zelda game without bosses is like beef stew with only beef in it. There, a completely new intro. Anyway, the point is Zelda bosses are each special and interesting and memorable and are a big part of what makes the Zelda game so spicy. And in Twilight Princess, there are a ton of them. And they're plenty spicy. After the awesome reception of the boss lore video I did on Ocarina of Time, I decided to go ahead and make this sequel video, explaining the lore behind all the bosses in Twilight Princess. And if you missed the Ocarina of Time video, no worries, it'll be linked in the description below. Also, I was helped by the one and only Lon Lon historian for several bosses in this video, so a huge thanks to him for his XL-sized input. So here we go, yeah, and uh, spoiler alert, obviously. To start, we're gonna go over all of the bosses in the game that were made through the power of the Fused Shadow, which would encompass the first three, Diababa from the Forest Temple, Phyrus from the Goron Mines, and more fuel from the lake bed temple, each of which are pretty easy to explain. As a reminder, or in case you've never played the game, the three main light spirits in the game were responsible for sealing away the powerful dark magic that the interlopers created in order to spite the gods. See, the goddesses themselves weren't the biggest fans of this idea, so they had the light spirits seal the magic away in the fused shadow relics, which were then each hidden within the aforementioned temples. Except for the one that Midna wears on her head. She just kind of has that one when we meet her, which she got at some point after being turned into an imp. We don't really know where she got it. Maybe the interlopers took one with them when they were banished through the mirror into the Twilight Realm, but hey, at least it's conveniently the perfect fit for her imp-sized cranium. Anyway, the three fused shadows that were placed within the temples kind of ended up corrupting whatever life forms they came in contact with, which is what fused shadows do, according to Lineru, since they're essentially made of dark magic. The first boss in the game, Diababa, is actually just a Deku Baba. You know, one of these plants. These really annoying plants. It's clear from the giant Deku Baba heads and the name Baba in Diababa that it was indeed a corrupted Deku Baba. And now I've said Deku Baba too many times and it doesn't sound real. Moving on, Phyrus from the Goron Mines is actually the patriarch of the Gorons who had entered the mine in order to figure out why the volcano was acting so weird. Darbus apparently came into contact with the fused shadow once entering the volcano and boom, evil transformation. Fortunately, Link's many stabs from his sword didn't actually kill him, it just beat the evil out of him and he soon returned to normal right after, not remembering anything of the affair. The boss of the Water Temple, I mean, the lake bed temple, Morpheal is once again a fused shadow corrupted eel, which is evidenced by its eel-like appearance and the word eel in its name, Morpheal. And it's not super hard to believe that an eel was living underwater, so we'll call this one good. Next, let's move on to a very similar kind of boss in the game, those that were corrupted by the pieces of the Mirror of Twilight instead of the fused shadow, which happens after Zant destroys the mirror to preemptively prevent Midna from crossing over to the other side. Since he was only able to break it into four pieces, one of which remained on the mirror frame, he needed some place to hide them. So he pulled a light spirits move and hid each piece within a temple or mansion on top of a mountain. And speaking of a mansion on top of the mountain, the Snow Peak Ruins is the location of the first boss, Blizzetta. Blizzetta is really just a little yeti lady named Yetta who lives alone with her husband appropriately named Yeto and who really likes her piece of the Mirror of Twilight. So much so that bam, it corrupts her and turns her into a monster and may have even snapped her neck. Fortunately, you only really have to break the evil ice she builds up around her, leaving her body unscathed after the fight and fit for some husband and wife lovin'. Moving on, the next piece of the mirror is found in the distant past of the Temple of Time. It's curious as to how Zant was able to do this since the Door of Time doesn't open in the game until Link places the Master Sword in its pedestal once again, something Zant would not have been able to do, but that's another theory for another day. The boss of the Temple of Time is the Twilight Arachnid Armagoma, who is literally just a giant tarantula spider, meaning the Mirror Shard must have corrupted a tarantula spider in order to make Armagoma and sprout an evil eye on her back and we know it's a her because she makes lots of babies. This boss definitely gets yeeted from existence though, and once sufficiently sent to the afterlife, as all spiders should be, procures the second mirror shard. The final shard can be found high in the sky, in the city in the sky, inhabited by the strange Uka race of little chicken people. Anyway, these little chicken people were being harassed by a dragon sent by Zant named Argarok, the Twilit Dragon, who Zant created by corrupting one of the regular Kargarok bird dinosaur enemies with the final shard of the mirror. I'm not sure if Zant meant for Argarok to immediately begin terrorizing the Uka people in the sky, or if he simply wanted to hide a shard in the most mobile form he could think of. But either way, Link and Midna are able to locate and kill the beastie and thus reclaim the final mirror shard. With the bosses made through both forms of Twilight Corruption out of the way, let's now shift our focus to the bosses that are just regular beings or monsters in the world of Hyrule, untainted by the corruption of Twilight. The first boss on this list is the caked-up baboon named Ook, who is the very first mini-boss of the game, actually. Ook is the leader of 
of the tribe of monkeys that live in the Faron Woods just outside Ordona, and is normally just a regular funny monkey guy until he got corrupted, but no, not by the Twilight. See, Ook somehow had a parasitic bug latch onto his forehead, which was the reason he started to go insane in the first place. This parasitic bug has designs that are similar to the goats of Ordon, which my good buddy Lon Lon Historian astutely pointed out. So it's probably safe to say that this bug is actually a natural parasite that just so happened to latch onto Ook, maybe even while the Cake Master was sleeping. Either way, once properly spanked, Ook smashes into a nearby totem pole so hard that it knocks the parasite off of his head, which ends up dying immediately after detaching from its host. Kinda makes you feel bad for mercilessly destroying Ook's ass when you could have just knocked off the bug, huh? Anyway, next up we have the Goron guard named Dan Goro, or as I like to call him, Dan, who we meet in the Goron mines. Dan's just a good guy who's doing his job of protecting the sacred treasure hidden within the mines, which is, of course, the hero's bow. Dan isn't really the brightest, though, so instead of just asking why Link is there, Dan jumps straight to trying to murder him. Once you dump Dan into the lava a couple times, Dan listens to your reasons for being there and immediately goes back to being friendly and lets you pass. Just an ordinary Dan who jumped the gun a bit too early. Next up, we have the Deku Toad from the Lakebed Temple, and honestly, this one is just as simple as its wildlife of Hyrule that somehow made its home in the temple underneath Lake Hylia, and just so happened to move into the room that just so happened to have the claw shot inside it, which the toad just so happened to swallow. I highly doubt that there was some grand scheme from the makers of the temple for the hero to slice up a literal toad, or rather the toad's tongue, in order to regain the sacred claw shot from its stomach acids. Yeah, pretty sure this one's just an accident of nature. Anyway, weird vomiting amphibic enemies aside, next up we have the familiar Skull Kid from the Lost Woods, I mean the Sacred Grove. It's my opinion that this is the very same Skull Kid as the Skull Kid from Ocarina of Time in Majora's Mask because he knows Saria's song, which the Hero of Time taught to a particular Skull Kid hundreds of years ago. Plus, Skull Kids are immortal, so it's definitely possible. But, of course, it's also possible that it's just a different Skull Kid since there are an unknown number of them living in the woods and they could have just heard the song. The Skull Kid is a childlike forest spirit who loves games and mischief and who, in this case, forces Link to play with him before allowing Link access to the area deep within the woods where the Temple of Time and therefore the Master Sword rest. But he's not really a bad guy, he's just the fantasy version of it's a prank, bro! Next up is the Dark Hammer from the mysterious Snow Peak Ruins. Now, this is definitely one of the more obscure bosses in the game, but I personally subscribe to the notion that, since the Snow Peak Ruins itself has strong ties to the royal family of Hyrule, and since there are many cages and other Dark Hammer suits of armor present in the ruins, the Dark Hammer must be the result of some sort of experimental super soldier that the royal family was trying their best to procure. It's not like they haven't done some very similar, very shady, war tactic things in the past either, case in point being the Shadow Temple from Ocarina of Time, and they do also have some of their knights use the ball and chain weapon over in the Fallen timeline. Also, it does make sense that this Dark Hammer would simply be one of many due to the sheer number of giant three-fingered suits of armor present throughout the ruins. So adding this all together, it's my interpretation that the Dark Hammer that Link fights in the game is a fragment of the ruins' history, which is that there were experimental super soldiers created possibly from the Lizalfos or Dinalfos species and stored within the ruins, one of which was still alive and sprung to life when Link tried to pass through this storage room. But of course, this is all theoretical, and if you personally have a better theory that you'd rather believe, you are more than welcome to believe that instead. But I will say, if you're interested in the subject and you want to learn more, Zeltic has a very good theory video that sums up what I'm trying to talk about. I'll link to it in the description below. Moving on though, the next non-Twilight boss would be the very similar Dark Nut, which is another giant armor-clad enemy that's even more intelligent and even more humanoid than the Dark Hammer. Now, I have an entire in-depth theory on the Dark Nut enemies in general and how they link to both the Hero of Time and the Hero of Twilight, which I will link in the description below again if you are interested in a deeper dive into this concept. But, in a nutshell, it is again my interpretation that the Dark Nut Knights are none other than corrupted Knights of Hyrule. The biggest evidence being their physical placements and the clear Loftwing symbology on not only their Twilight Princess appearances, but also their Wind Waker appearance, where they're shown to flout out own Knight's Crests, which again features a prominent Loftwing symbol and heavily emphasizes a knight. So yeah, in a nutshell, Dark Nuts are corrupted Knights of Hyrule, but for more info, check out my theory from 2020. Moving on, the next natural boss in the game is the Errol Foes, which simply put is another sword and shield wielding humanoid lizard enemy, just like the Lizal Foes and Dinal Foes who are also similarly named, except the Errol Foes is airborne with wings, making them more 
deadly and therefore more rare. And also like the lizard foes and dino foes, the Errol foes serves the forces of evil. It's a long-running theory that all of these lizard enemies are nothing more than the creations of malice since they're shown to be made of malice in Breath of the Wild, which would technically mean that they come from demise and are actually demons, but that's a separate theory. For the purposes of this video, the Errol foes is just another evil serving lizard monster that seems to be guarding the second claw shot the first time we see it in the game. Perhaps trying to prevent the hero from obtaining the necessary item to complete the city in the sky dungeon and therefore claim the final mirror shard. And finally, it's time to talk about the most recurring boss in the game, King Bulblin. Or as I like to call him, Zelda Shrek. This guy's existence and purpose is described by his name. He's the king of the Bulblin species of monsters. And he even explains why he and his people are so actively trying to kill you of their own volition. He follows the strongest side. Simply put, he must have witnessed the power of Xant at some point in the game and decided that for the health and well-being of he and his people, if he wanted to survive, he should probably be on Xant's side. But after witnessing Link in his powerful abs, decided to switch sides to the good side. Nobody likes a bandwagoner, but hey, at least he's honest. The bigger question here is where do the Bulblin species originate from in the first place, since they've rarely made appearances outside this game? But personally, I don't think this matters much, especially since they also make an appearance in the adult timeline in the game's spirit tracks. Meaning they're out there in the world of Hyrule and beyond, we just don't see them very often. Some people believe that the Bulbins are none other than the evolved Gerudo women, but uh, yeah, no, I, I don't buy that personally. Especially because according to the encyclopedia, the Gerudo had actually moved further into the desert at this point, explaining their absence. The Bulbins must have just been another species of monster, just like Bacoblins, or Moblins, or Lynels, or you know, all the other species of monsters in the series. Oh, and King Bulbin's mount also has a name, Lord Bulbo, Lord of all Bulbos, which are the giant pig monsters that Bulblins ride on. And that's about it. The last natural boss we'll discuss before moving on to the main character bosses is the one, the only, the Twilight Bloat. This gorgeous, elegant creature has many similarities to a queen termite, another gorgeous, Aww. elegant creature. Their beauty is beyond compare, and just like the termite, I believe the Twilight Bloat is the mother of all the shadow insects. Their queen, if you will, which were created by Xant in order to steal the light spirits' tears of twilight. What a beautiful animal species. Now with all the non-main character bosses out of the way, it's time to focus on the two that started it all. Xant and the big man Ganondorf himself. But let's start with Xant. Ant with a Z had a job before he usurped the Twilight Throne in the Twilight Royal Castle. He was a helper of the Twilight Royal family who served them because he believed that he would be the next appointed to rule. However, to his dismay, when it came time to choose the next leader, it was Midna who was chosen instead of Xant because people could see that he lusted for power and not much else. And she was then given the powers that only the ruler of the Twilight can possess. Now, it's unknown if the Twilight had a royal bloodline like the Hylian royal family has, which would imply that if Midna and Xant are both up for the crown that they would both be related, or if it's simply the matter of appointing the next monarch regardless of blood relation. Either way, Xant got a little perturbed at this since after all, he was patient and tried to wait his turn. And in his desperation, while he was literally throwing a temper tantrum on a balcony, he lifted his eyes and saw a god. And this god had a name, Ganondorf. Ganondorf vested part of his power, which is a mixture of dark Gerudo magic stemming from his mother twin Rova and that of the Triforce of Power in Xant, giving Xant much more power than that of the simple ruler of Twilight. With this new power, he cursed Midna to forever assume the imp-like form we see her in for the majority of the game, and then transformed all the remaining Twilight people into mindless beasts that only serve him, known as the Shadow Beasts. After taking care of any potential pushback from his fellow Twilight, he then set his sights on the world he wished to conquer, the Light World. With Ganondorf's power, he crossed over into Hyrule and then tasked King Bulblin to locate the Light Spirits in order to send Shadow Beasts to their locations to snuff them out, plunge the light into Twilight, and transfer the Light Spirits' tears of light to the Shadow Insects in one fell swoop. He then took the remaining Shadow Beasts and powerfully assaulted Hyrule Castle itself and was greeted with total surrender from the Hylian ruler, Princess Zelda. However, eventually Xant remembered that he has yet to possess the full power of the ruler of Twilight and tracks down Link and Midna of his own volition. He then asks Midna, who is the true ruler of Twilight, to join him, most likely implying that he would appreciate it if she would add her power to his. She refuses this because he's hella creepy, and then Xant proceeds to thrust her into the light world, which for a being of Twilight that can't 
can't exist in the light is probably something that felt kind of like a fish being forced to swim in lava. Of course, Zelda saves Midna's life by sacrificing her essence, and meanwhile, Zand heads off to the Arbiter's grounds to try to break apart the mirror and prevent the heroic duo from hunting him down. He even makes an appearance right before Link and Midna head up to the mirror chamber and revives an ancient stall enemy as a boss. Uh, oh, what's that? You notice I haven't covered Stallard yet? Keep watching, I'll get to him. Anyway, after which Zan proceeds to seemingly retreat back to the Twilight Castle in the Realm of Twilight, which ends up being the very place that he would meet his end. After piecing together the Mirror of Twilight, Link and Midna then enter the Twilight Realm and kill Zant once and for all, but not before he was able to confess to them the true origin of his powers, enter Ganondorf. Now, if you've been a Zelda fan for a while, or if you've watched my previous boss video, you know why Ganondorf rose to power and all the lore surrounding his reasons, so I'll skip over his origin story for now. However, I will explain what I think happened to him after Link was sent back in time at the end of Ocarina of Time. See, most people know that Ganondorf was captured and his plans were prevented, but there's a bit more to that story. Once Ganondorf was captured, he wasn't sentenced to death immediately. According to Aonuma, his execution at the Arbiter's Grounds happened several years after the events of Ocarina of Time, since we can assume that Link warned Zelda and the Hylian royal family of Ganondorf's true intentions pretty much immediately following his being sent back in time, which would have directly led to Ganondorf's capture. This means that Ganondorf was most likely imprisoned for several years before his banishment. Where was he imprisoned, you ask? Why, at the Arbiter's Grounds, of course. Now, this is where things get interesting, because the Arbiter's Grounds was, according to Auru, or Aru, however you say his name, the site where the worst criminals in the land were held and executed, filling the grounds themselves with their malice. Now, Aru also says that the people who were sentenced to be executed were instead sent directly to the Underworld, aka the Realm of Twilight, via the Mirror of Twilight. But we can tell this is only half true, because those who were banished were specifically only the ancient interlopers as described by Laneru. But that was a long, long time ago. There also just happens to be dead bodies and Poe's present everywhere within the Arbiter's grounds, implying pretty heavily that there were, in fact, inmates who were actually killed here as well, with their malicious souls haunting the hallways to this day. Enter one of the creepiest bosses in the game, the Deathblade. It's my simplistic personal interpretation that the Deathblade is literally the malice of the dead that Aru speaks of haunting the Arbiter's grounds, or at least some of it. As Lon Lon Historian and I were researching, the blade itself was most likely the execution blade that was responsible for taking countless lives of prisoners, leading to the blade itself being haunted by their combined evil essences. This also explains why the blade is being held down to the ground with ropes covered in what looks to be Ofura seals, which are used in several religions such as Shinto and Buddhism, which are present in Japan and believed to do several things, one of which is sealing spirits away. On the ground surrounding the blade is a giant summoning circle with runes drawn on the inside, and only when the ropes attaching the Ofura seals to the sword are severed, the Death Sword spirit is released, heavily implying that this room and the blade itself are meant to trap the souls of the most malicious dead inmates within. The goat-like spirit that materializes to control the sword is, in my opinion, the spirit that the sword was harboring, which is in and of itself another combination of Poe's spirits, like Bongo Bongo from Ocarina of Time. However, this was not the only way that inmates were executed in the Arbiter's Grounds. Have you ever thought it was weird that the entire Arbiter's Grounds setup is built as a coliseum? See, I think this plays into the reasons why Arbiter's Grounds has been condemned and people are now forbidden to even travel there. Because what's the point of a coliseum? Combat that normally ends in merciless, gruesome deaths for slaves or prisoners. What if the big, dark secret of the Arbiter's Grounds isn't just that there's a goddess-ordained banishing relic held there, or even that inmates used to be executed there, but that the worst prisoners, the ones who Hyrule hated the most, were sentenced to a gruesome death by combat against an insurmountable foe in the midst of the Colosseum. Enter Star-Lord, the Twilight Fossil. Now again, just like several other bosses in this video, this is just my theory, and you're more than welcome to believe whichever one you want. Lots of fans of the series get caught up trying to figure out who Star-Lord is, as in whether or not Star-Lord is related to Volvagia, or perhaps King Dodongo from Ocarina of Time, since they're dinosaurs and they all share the same boss fight theme. However, I personally feel that this line of thinking is impossible, because this is all assuming that Star-Lord is somehow younger than the aforementioned lizard bosses, simply because Twilight Princess takes place after Ocarina of Time when all signs point to the contrary. Since Aonuma states that Twilight Princess takes place somewhere between 100 and 200 years after Ocarina of Time, and Arbiter's Grounds is clearly an ancient, rundown coliseum that alone implies age of potentially thousands of years, not one or two hundred. Given this, and the sheer size of the colossal Star-Lord himself, and the fact that he was alive long enough to grow that big and then dead long enough to completely decompose, I'd wager that Star-Lord himself is as ancient, if not more ancient, than the Arbiter's Grounds Coliseum itself. Meaning, the question isn't really whether Star- 
Star-Lord is or is a descendant of Volvagia or the Dodongos, but rather whether they are the descendants of Star-Lord. But aside from who Star-Lord is, isn't it strange that there's a giant monster placed right in the middle of an ancient desert coliseum? Isn't it possible that, given the nature of giant monsters and coliseums, and the fact that the Arbiter's Grounds was the location where many prisoners were killed, that Star-Lord himself was used as an execution method for whoever was in prison there? As in, Star-Lord was executioned by combat? Think about it, why would Star-Lord be placed here, in the center of the grounds, directly underneath the mirror chamber? As a guard for the mirror? I heavily doubt that, since Star-Lord was long dead before Zant's scimitar of Twilight brought him back to life. And how would Star-Lord have even gotten moved inside here in the first place? Perhaps the grounds were built for and around Star-Lord himself. Perhaps Star-Lord is the entire point of the Colosseum. And furthermore, what's with all the stall soldiers that Star-Lord can raise up from the sand at will? If you notice, they're all wearing armor, but it's very rudimentary and cheap looking and not at all like the armor of the soldiers of Hyrule. So it can be assumed that these non-Hylian soldiers were instead prisoners who were given cheap equipment to feign the hope that they could stand in combat against the terrifying Star-Lord. And again, as a reminder, this has actually happened in human history. See the history of gladiators and the Colosseums. And Nintendo draws inspiration from history time and time again for the Zelda games. The point I'm trying to make though is that by the time Ganondorf was imprisoned here within the grounds, prisoners were actually being executed there, either by way of the Death Sword quickly or by combat via Stalord's Colosseum chamber. And this is also why the sages attempted to execute Ganondorf before resorting to banishing him, which is heavily implied with this cutscene to be something that they only do as an absolute last resort. So here is a neat little what if explanation theory for you. What if Ganondorf, who was imprisoned for years and sentenced to death, was sentenced to die at the hands of the monster Star-Lord? And what if Ganondorf was actually the one prisoner who was able to kill him? Perhaps this is even why Ganondorf tells Zant to go resurrect Star-Lord using Ganon's own power. He knew where Star-Lord's corpse was because he was the one who made him a corpse. And this led to the sages taking matters into their own hands and freaking out a little bit since Ganondorf killed the big bad Star-Lord and deciding to execute Ganondorf personally, or, you know, at least attempting to. But as most people know, this was unsuccessful, and Ganondorf was able to kill the Sage of the Water before ultimately being banished out of the Sage's desperation into the Twilight Realm, along with the very same Sword of the Sages that was meant to end his life. And once banished within the Twilight, Ganondorf... Ganondorf was left bodiness... Ganondorf was left bodiless, but alive, and was able to rebuild and recharge his power while waiting over 100 years for a suitable host who would help him return to his beloved kingdom of Hyrule and finally claim the throne he so desperately desired. Once Zant was denied the crown and showed his true childish colors, Ganondorf saw the potential for Zant to be emotionally manipulated, and housed part of his power within Zant, telling him not only to conquer the Twilight, but to also conquer Hyrule within the Light World, so that he himself could return via Zant's new power after Hyrule has already fallen. And once Ganondorf was able to return to the light, he headed straight for the throne, sealing it off with a powerful Triforce-enabled barrier once he arrived, abandoning his disciple Zant to fall at the hands of the Twilight Princess. And this is where he awaited Link and Midna's arrival until the end of the game, when he and Link and Midna and Zelda wage an epic battle against one another that starts in the throne room and ends in Hyrule Field, where Link is finally able to best him in one-on-one -on -one combat using the skills passed down from the Hero Shade, who poetically was the first hero to face the Gerudo King, in order to end Ganondorf once and for all. And at the end of his life, when Ganondorf once again called upon the power of the Triforce of Power to save him from death as it did once before with the Sages, Zant strangely pops up on the screen and cracks his own neck to the side, which seemingly directly results in Ganondorf's actual final death. And for a much more in-depth explanation as to why Zant popped up here and how his neck crack possibly ended Ganondorf's life, check out the video I made on that exact topic. It'll be linked below along with all the other theories. Twilight Princess has some of the greatest bosses in the entire franchise, and it was my absolute pleasure putting this video together for you guys. Once again, thank you so much for the awesome turnout on the original video, and thank you for watching this one. And if you'd like for me to continue with explaining the bosses in the other Zelda games, let me know which ones in the comments below. Also, let me know if you learned anything new in this video. And if you would be so kind, please consider liking the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe if you haven't already for many more video gaming videos to come. Huge thanks as always to my Bandit crew, of which I 
I have a few amazing new names to announce. Say hello to JWatt8554 who joined at the top masked bandit tier. I mean, oh my gosh, thank you. And say hello to Jamie P and Debbie B for joining the ranks as well as all the others who support the channel every month. You guys are all so amazing and are the reason I continue to do what I do. And that's about all I've got in this one. So as always, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Follow me on my socials and I'll see you next time. This is Bandit signing out. Peace.